This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Do you have an idea for a blockchain app but are worried about the time and cost it will take to develop? The new Azure Blockchain Dev Kit is a free download that brings together the tools you need to get your first app running in less than 30 minutes. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. And by Trail of Bits. Don't leave your project's security audit to just any firm. Trust a team with decades of experience at the forefront of blockchain security research. Go to trailofbits.com to learn more. Hello and welcome to Epicenter. My name is Brian Farman Crane. And my name is Sunny Agarwal. So before we go into our conversation, we just wanted to let you guys know about uh, a conference or some events that are coming up. Actually, both Sunny and I will be there. So this is there's this conference called Biddle, which is, uh, you know, it's kind of the, the Ethereum HODL, right? The Biddle, which is taking place in South Korea and Seoul on July 22nd and 23rd. So, you know, both Sunny and I are going to be there. And uh, I think we're both going to give uh, talks at the conference. So I'm super excited personally to like make it. I've never been to South Korea and I actually, yeah, I actually haven't even been to Asia since I've become involved in the blockchain space. Right. So, so I haven't kind of never had the sort of the exposure to the Asian blockchain world. I'm super excited uh, about that as well. Also, just before that conference, there is a, a hackathon taking place in Seoul as well. So that's on the Friday to Sunday, and, and we'll put a link in the show notes. So that's Friday, uh, July 19th to uh, Sunday, July 21st. So we'll also be at that. Uh, we're with Course One. We're, uh, we're one of the sponsors of that event. And so, yeah, hopefully maybe see some of you either at Biddle uh, or at or at the uh, hackathon, maybe we should do uh, like epicenter meetup there or something like that. It's so, going like, to be a uh, be Cosmos hack- hackathon as well. So you know, if you're interested in coming on, working on some cool Cosmos SDK kind of stuff or Tendermint, so you know, it'll be a really fun experience. I think I'll, I'll be uh, mentoring and judging. Okay, fantastic. And yeah, with that, so today we spoke about with uh, Hayden Adams. He's the founder of Uniswap. Uniswap is one of those things that uh, I think I remember he mentioned uh, it was launched in uh, during DEF CON in Prague. And I think I mentioned it, I, I remember hearing about it back then where people, oh, this Uniswap thing, this new Uniswap thing. And there started being quite a lot of buzz around it and became kind of one of the first, uh, uh, most widely used uh, Ethereum DeFi project in a very short time. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that was our conversation with, with Hayden. So yeah, with that, let's go, let's go into the conversation. I think it's really interesting to dive into Uniswap and, and kind of define decentralized exchanges more general. So let's go there. So we're here today with Hayden Adams. He's the founder of Uniswap and Uniswap was one of these things that kind of came out of nowhere. And, you know, all of a sudden there was, you know, lots, relatively lots, but lots of, lots of activity happening. And it kind of became one of the main the most used uh, Ethereum kind of DeFi dApps. So yeah, we're really uh, excited to have Hayden on today to dive a little bit into like you know, what Uniswap is and, you know, kind of his thoughts on the future of decentralized exchanges and uh, decentralized finance. So thank, thanks so much for joining us today, Hayden. Yeah, thank you for having me on. So, yeah, it's often interesting to hear a little bit, okay, what, what was your journey? How did you kind of become involved in the Ethereum space and like find your way towards working on Uniswap? Yeah, um, it might feel like uh, Uniswap came out of nowhere for you guys, but actually, before it was even announced, I worked on it for over a year. Um, but yeah, I I basically I was a mechanical engineering major, um, so I uh, I spent you know out to, after I graduated um, from college, I spent a year working in uh, thermodynamics, studying uh, heat flow and car designs. Um, but I was sort of passively following cri- the uh, crypto space. Um, a good friend of mine from college, Carl Flourish, had joined the Ethereum Foundation, and so he was sort of constantly talking about Ethereum and slowly piquing my interest. Um, and I actually got laid off uh, from work in about, I believe, June 2017, uh, just as the sort of crypto uh, bull run started. Um, and I really was interested in the space at that point, and I wanted to get more involved. And I decided, you know, mechanical engineering was interesting, but not that interesting. Um, and I just decided to dive into crypto. 
Um, and I was looking, and so I spent, you know, a couple months just messing around, learning Solidity, uh, you know, trying out uh, token contracts. Uh, but I was looking for a real project to sort of grow and, and uh, improve on um, and really become a, 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 you know, a smart contract developer. Carl at the, t- at the time pointed me to some blog posts from Vitalik talking about something called a uh, X times Y equals K market maker. Um, and so I basically started working on the uh, first version of Uniswap in October 2017. And so it was basically my first project. Um, it was in some, to some extent, it was my first big uh, uh, project as a developer, um, and it was definitely my first project in crypto. And so I spent you know, a few months building a proof of concept for that. Uh, and you know, it, I sort of, it, I never really thought it would go that far, but I was, you know, I started, I just created this initial website that allowed you to swap between two tokens, and then I slowly started adding features onto it. Uh, you know, pooled liquidity across multiple liquidity providers, uh, chaining swaps so you could go ERC-20 to ETH and then ETH to another ERC-20 in a single transaction. You know, I figured out fee payouts. And once it started to seem like this could be a little bit more than just a side project, I applied for an Ethereum Foundation grant. And this was in April 2018. So I worked on it through the winter, basically on my own. And I continued specking it out from there. I, the Ethereum Foundation grant was, grant, uh, was granted. Um, and so... At that point, it became a lot more real. So I hired a runtime verification to formalize the uh, uh, coding spec and formalize the X times Y equals K model. And I hired some contractors to work on the interface. Uh, I wrote the white paper. I wrote documentation. And this was through the summer into early fall 2018. And then I announced it on Twitter to a few hundred Twitter followers in, uh, at DevCon 3 in Prague. And uh, November 2nd, I believe, or November 4th, uh, 2018. And then it kind of exploded from there. And so this was like sort of your first ever software engineering project you really took on. Yeah, uh, <laughs> to some extent. I mean, I was a mechanical engineer before. So it's not that it's not that I never I, I, it's not that I had never written code before. But the code I had written was more about, you know, it was more like MATLAB style or, you know, Arduino robots. You know, very, very small stuff. This was my first real, you know, the, the first uh, website, uh, the first interface for Uniswap was my first website. And the uh, Uniswap contract was my first, yeah. It, so, it, and like the testing for Uniswap was the first unit test I'd ever written. So it was, you know, yeah, it was basically the first coding project. Um, yeah. And so did you also have any experience with like, you know, trading and stuff or any experience with like, you know, dealing with exchanges as a user? Okay, so not really. I, well, as a user, a little bit. Um, I had used Coinbase. Um, I had used Bittrex. I used some of the centralized exchanges, and I had heard a lot about sort of the some of the like. I heard obviously heard about Mt. Gox. I um, I knew about Ether Delta, and so at the time I started working on Uniswap, Ether Delta was the was the Dex. You know, it was and it was a big step forward in some ways. It um, it was non custodial. Which was a big deal. I kind of under, I kind of recognize that um, the exchange no longer held your funds and it couldn't steal them. Uh, but it wasn't decentralized in the way that Ethereum was decentralized, and it wasn't censorship resistant the way Ethereum was censorship resistant, and it was kind of a pain to use. And so when I started experimenting with Uniswap, it was an experiment in being as uncompromising uncom- as possible on the decentralization and censorship resistant fronts. Uh, while and and on the UX fronts as well. Um, basically, yeah, th- those were the properties of Ethereum that had interested me. You know, the fact that you couldn't shut just shut down Ethereum, the fact that no one controlled Ethereum, even though no one could steal the funds in Ether Delta, people could still shut it down. People could still, you know, there was still someone controlling the order book the, or, the, or hosting an order book. There was still someone that you know, had, was able to take down the smart contracts or upgrade them or control the token listing or take fees off of every transaction. It wasn't decentralized in the way that Ethereum is. And so that's really, that was like the, the sort of, from a research side, from a sort of experimental side, that's what I was going for with Uniswap. Was there kind of like a deeper reason why you cared about, you know, this particular aspect? You know, there's so many different things that you could build out in the Ethereum space and smart contract space. So why focus on exchange? Why focus on exchange? Well, 
I mean, to some extent, I kind of wandered into it. I didn't, wasn't something that I, you know, I, I didn't enter the, the Ethereum space immediately saying, oh, I need to work on exchange. But it was more like I need a project to, to learn on. I need a project to, you know, figure out how, to, how, to, how smart contracts work and what they really do. And that just ended up being Uniswap. Uh, the more I spent, the more time I spent building it, the more interested in exchange I got, the more interested in automated market making I got. Um, so it kind of developed naturally. It wasn't, yeah. Um, but it, it seems like, funny, funny enough, it was the most overcrowded space, and yet it was still not being served in certain ways, right? There were a lot of projects in the space, but they all had like compromised on certain things that I didn't think should be compromised on. Um, or at least I thought it was worth experimenting in a project, project that did not compromise on those things. Um, yeah. Well, let, let's dive into Uniswap a little bit. So, I mean, we mentioned, okay, decentralized exchange. You mentioned this market maker thing. Like, what give us your like, high level overview of like, how does Uniswap work? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Uniswap is a decentralized exchange protocol on high level. Um, and it's made up of a, a series of automated market makers. Uh, so, basically, the way it works, is that every single there's um, there's a, a series of exchange contracts, one for each token, um, and each uh, and each exchange contract represents an ERC twenty to Ether pair, uh, so it allows you to trade between Ether and ERC twenty tokens, um, and they are all linked together by a factory slash registry contract that basically uh, holds a uh, mapping of token addresses to exchange addresses, and so it allows you to look up you know if you have a token address, it allows you to look up the exchange address associated with that token. And so each, uh, so if you want to dive into more of how each exchange contract works, let's say you have a uh, ETH to DAI pair, right? So anyone who wants can uh, call the uh, factory contract and deploy this uh, DAI exchange contract. Uh, and then anyone who wants can deposit liquidity into that DAI exchange contract. And so there's two classes of users in uh, one of these exchanges. There's liquidity providers and there's traders. Liquidity providers um, basically deposit two tokens, Ether and the ERC-20, into one of these exchange contracts. And then, user, and then traders basically uh, send one token to the contract and get the other token out. Um, one of the cool sort of aspects of, that it's trying to solve is removing the need to coordinate users under an order book. Um, and you, know, you don't need to actually, it's, it's sort of solving some of the coordination between liquidity providers and traders. You have one of these uh, exchange contracts. And let's say someone, and you, uh, a liquidity provider, the first liquidity provider would put in an equivalent USD value of ETH in that ERC-20 token. So they might put in $50,000 worth of ETH and $50,000 worth of DAI. Um, and then there's a, uh, and then exchange between the two assets are automated uh, using this formula, X times Y equals K, which we're calling the uh, constant product market making formula. And basically the way it works is, you know, you have 10 ETH and uh, 1,000 die in the contract, then the, uh, the constant would be 10,000. Um, and then if you send one ETH to the contract, then now there's 11 ETH in the contract. The contract says, well, the ETH times the die in the contract needs to be held constant. So you do you know, 10,000 divided by 11, and that gives you the amount of die that should be in the contract, which is you know, uh, 909. And so it returns 91 back to the buyer, which is you know, the difference between the amount that's in the contract and the amount that should be in the contract. So essentially what's happening here, just to just to clarify, is that basically, you know, the more that people are buying, that the system sort of is automatically cranking up the price. And the more people are selling, it's cranking down the price. Correct. Yeah. The more you the more you sell, the high yeah, the the higher the exchange rate goes. Um, and that's basically, you know, what we're calling slippage. So if you you in general you want to make a trade that is small relative to the total size and the liquidity reserves. So, you know, if you have a million dollars in the contract, you can make $10,000 trades. You can't make $500,000 trades because that will have a huge amount of slippage. Yeah, and, and of course, some of our listeners will remember our episode with Bancor, which, you know, is a few years ago now, but Bancor kind of had a similar mechanism, right? Where you also had like this contract on chain, and then the idea is, okay, anybody can go there and you know, there's always a price, right? The, the contract's always willing to trade with you. Whereas, you know, with a traditional exchange, you have like buyers and sellers and there has to be some sort of matching. And, you know, if there's no, let's say there's lo little liquidity and maybe there, there are no buyers or, or very few buyers. Whereas here, 
uh, I, I guess one of the benefits is that it 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 might work especially well for you know illiquid markets too. Yeah, yeah, correct. Um, Bancor is very similar to Uniswap. Uh, one of the main differences is that uh, Uniswap uses Ether. So Bancor and, and Uniswap both have a common pair. Uh, in Uniswap, it's Ether, and in Bancor, it's the BNT token. Um, we think that you know, sort of part of the idea is that you know having Ether is sort of more liquid and represents the uh, a, it's the sort of underlying token for the protocol. Whereas BNT was this just token that Bancor made and sold thirty uh, percent of for one hundred and fifty million dollars or something crazy like that. Maybe I don't know the exact percent they sold, but I know the exact amount they raised, which was one hundred and fifty three million. What's the what's the trading volume today on Uniswap versus Bancor? Uh, today, you know, today is not. It kind of it's hard to it's or hard like, to measure the uh, the Bancor volume because they kind of track it with EO, their their volume on EOS and then their volume um, and then they double count um, through uh, volume through BNT. But the Uniswap volume today is five hundred thousand. Just for some context, like you know, I know when I checked a few weeks ago. Uh, Uniswap has uh, the highest volume of any exchange. It, it, it's it's about ten. It had the its volume is about ten x that of zero uh, x. Uh, it it is on some days, not not today. Today actually zero x is higher volume. Um, but Uniswap had hit a peak volume of six million about dollars in one day about two weeks ago. Today is just like a low volume day. Um, but yeah, it, it on on many days it's the number one dex in, in Ethereum. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft and the Azure Blockchain Workbench. Getting your blockchain from the whiteboard to production can be a big undertaking. And something as simple as connecting your blockchain to IoT devices or existing ERP systems is a project in itself. Well, the folks at Microsoft have you covered. You already know about the Azure Blockchain Workbench and how easy it makes bootstrapping your blockchain network pre-configured with all the cloud services you need for your enterprise app. Their new development kit is the IFTTT for blockchains, Suppose you want to collect data from someone in a remote location via SMS and have that data packaged in a transaction for your Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The development kit allows you to build this integration in just a few steps in a simple drag and drop interface. Here's another great example. Perhaps you're an institution working with Ethereum and rely on CSV files sent by email. One click in the dev kit and you can parse these files and have the data embedded in transactions. Whatever you're working with, the dev kit can read, transform, and act on the data. To learn more and to build your first application in less than 30 minutes, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And be sure to follow them on Twitter at MSFT Blockchain. We'd like to thank Microsoft and Azure for their support of Epicenter. So to go back to the, uh, some of the mechanisms of how it works, uh, so you, what, it's kind of like what's happening here is that you know the concept of slippage exists in you know m normal markets as well on like any exchange, but it's usually rather a in, in most exchanges and order books, it's an emergent property of the behavior that's exhibited by the actors in the system, right? So you know you'll often have market makers that come into the ecosystem and you know provide liquidity and you know. To incentivize themselves, they, they you know, they, they're, there's a spread between the the bid and the ask, and that that's what creates the slippage. Here in Uniswap, instead of like slippage being a emergent property, it is sort of the core property into the protocol. And, and so, can you explain, look, you know, what what's some of the rationale behind this, and what are some of the implications and second order implications of such a radical change to how we you know normally think about markets. Yeah, yeah. So you, you pretty much nailed it. Um, on a on an order book, you basically have you know constant bids and asks, and market makers are maintaining you know spreads, right? They'll, I'll always buy this token for one dollar and one cent, and I'll always or I'll always buy for, yeah, and then I'll always sell it for one dollars and five cents, something like that. Um, and then the more and then you know the more the, the the more expensive you get, the more people are willing to sell at that price. Um, and that sort of creates this natural, the more you buy, the, the more the, the price slips. Uh, in Uniswap, you know, it locks you into a curve. And it says, basically, the more you buy relative to the current liquidity available, it's, it's de a deterministic amount of slippage. And part of what that does is it forces all liquidity providers to basically work together rather than to compete. Right? So on traditional order books, liquidity providers 
are basically, you know, people with a, a lot of money, usually, and very sophisticated setups. And they're competing to offer the lowest slippage possible. Uh, and sometimes that actually, you know, the way it works out in many exchanges is that they basically are paid, they, they're paid by the, uh, the company that's, you know, by the exchange itself to um, operate tighter spreads to give users better rates. And then the uh, company sort of kicks some of that money back. And so the, company, the, the, uh, the exchange basically takes money on fees and then they kick it back to the liquidity providers. Um, Uniswap in some ways fully automates that. It basically says, we collect fees on trades, that all goes back to liquidity providers, but all liquidity providers are going to basically offer the, uh, same, the same rates and the same slippage, and then we'll buy pro rata from all of them, and then we'll pay fees out to them pro rata as well. Um, yes, it, it, it's a pretty big departure. Um, there, I haven't heard of very many pro rata exchanges in the uh, traditional finance world, um, but I think it's something that is it very difficult to do in the traditional finance world. It's something that almost you need something like Ethereum to, to create, at least in a way that is kind of doesn't require having, you know, people custody all their funds under one person who's, who's maintaining some, some formula. And yeah, one of, one, of the, one of the cool aspects of it is um, basically reducing the complexity of market making and reducing the barrier of entry to market making. So Uniswap basically fully automates the spread so you, you know, rather than needing to constantly you know, sort of main, be watching the price and maintaining the spread, if you're, if you're uh, a Uniswap liquidity provider, you could sort of look at where you, how you think the prices of the tokens will move long term, and then you can just lock them up in liquidity, uh, lock liquidity up in Uniswap and kind of leave it in. It's, you know, you're taking more bets on the, the initial and end price, and as long as you're kind of expecting it, some, some volume. Um, it also, you know, allows you to contribute a very small amount of liquidity. So traditionally, market makers, you know, they, they, have, they have to have a lot of money to sort of be able to operate these businesses. Um, in Uniswap, it, since it lumps everyone's liquidity together and, and pays out uh, fees pro rata and takes from them pro rata, you know, you could put in $10 or you can put in $1,000 or you can put in a million dollars. And no matter what, you'll get a, a portion of the fees directly proportional to your contribution, which is the risk that you're taking in the system. Um, so Uniswap has thousands of liquidity, like in the, uh, the ETH to die pair, for example, and Uniswap has $3 million, and more than 25% of that comes from liquidity uh, providers who put in less than 1% of the uh, total liquidity. So there's plenty of people who put in $100 or $50, and they're all collecting fees, which you know normally you can't be a market maker uh, with $50. Uh, so it, it, it almost turns it into... To some extent, it can, for some users, turn it into like an almost Robin Hood-like experience where you're like putting in a little bit of money and earning passive income, uh, while uh, for other people, they're putting in a larger amount and they're maybe updating their prices uh, and, and paying a little bit closer attention. I would love to dive in a bit this business model of the liquidity provider, right? Because basically, let's say in the, in the example you made, so we have $3 million that are kind of like locked in this uh, liquidity pool. And now let's say I put up uh, a million, right? So a third of this. And now all of the trading that's going on, 0.3%, uh, right? It's basically a fee. And that kind of gets added to the liquidity pool. So I put up a third, let's say, of the liquidity pool. Uh, but the liquidity pool now grows because fees are collected, right? So I'm now entitled to a third. And, you know, let's say over time, maybe a million dollars after like half a year, a million dollars worth of fees are uh, kind of accrued in the liquidity pool. So if I, and so now there's four million in there, even though only three was put in as cash. So I could like take it out and I would get like, you know, one point, uh, you know, one plus a third of a million out. And, and that would basically be sort of my profits, right? Correct. Yeah, um, there's some fun rules of thumb with it. Uh, so basically, your uh, if you take the the uh, daily volume um, times the uh, fee rate, so which is 0.3 percent, which is 0 0.003, and then you multiply that by 365 days in a year, it's basically the daily volume times 1.09. But you can kind of rule of thumb it at daily volume times one is the uh, um, the value in fees generated. So to put it in a different way, if you do a million dollars in in trading per day on Uniswap, then Uniswap will generate about a million dollars per year in fees. Um, and so there are, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a profit side and a loss side. I'm just going to focus on the fees and the profits, and then we'll get into where the losses come from. 
because um, they're, they're very separate. Um, so, you know, if you have $10 million in a liquidity pool and you do a million dollars per day in trading, uh, then you'll basically, you know, ignoring losses, you'd have about 10% returns because you generate a million dollars per year in fees off 10 million in the pool. And so that's 11 million, 10% APR. There's a whole losses side, uh, which kind of you have to factor in as well. Yeah, no, I just, just wanted to ask very briefly on, on this, this profit side. So in the die example you made, you have, because in the end, it kind of works out like an interest rate, right? Like I put in some money and then these fees and it, it's kind of like you make some return on that. So right, if you had a very dependable volume and a constant amount of liquidity, then it's basically just the daily volume over the total liquidity uh, is, is your interest rate. Right, it's a high, highly variable interest rate potentially. But so what, what is that right now for this DAI market, for example? You know, it fluctuates really because of how the trading works. There, there have been days where the DAI market did uh, like two, $2 million in trading off of, you know, off like a $3 million pool, which would be like a crazy return, right? It's, it's almost, you know, it's like a 60% return on that day. Um, if it did that every day for a year, it would be a 60% return. But then there are other days where it does, you know, $200,000 off a $3 million pool, which is a little bit lower. But the profits in general, the uh, DAI pool has been growing at a rate of about 11%. Uh, 11%? Yeah, so it, it's about an 11% return right now on the DAI pool, sort of averaged out. Um, ignoring the, uh, the, the losses side, which once again, I'll, I'll get into. And, and one of the interesting dynamics seems to be here, right? So let's say now in this DAI example, I mean, if you have $2 million worth of trading on this market, then okay, the return would be so high, but of course it means that there's a huge incentive for anybody else to like come in and like add liquidity to it. And then they can basically take a part of this return and you get this kind of dilution, right? So you'd expect that if there's a high trading volume, the liquidity pool kind of grows and then the returns come down again, right? Yeah, correct. You're, so you're sort of um, expecting the uh, liquidity pools to grow. Basically, the, the volume drive, in my mind, the volume drives liquidity more than the liquidity drives volume, though it's kind of both ways. It's, um, it's a little bit weird, right? Because if you have higher volume and then suddenly people have more liquidity, suddenly people can make better, tra there's tighter, like, People can get better rates, and then they can make larger trades, so maybe more people come into the market. Um, so it kind of could be a positive feedback loop. It could be the reverse, where you know everything's in a death spiral, um, or you know it finds some happy medium. Um, but yeah, basically, you're you're expecting the uh, pools to grow proportional to the volume, where everyone's kind of expecting to get some reasonable interest rate, kind of similar to where they might be able to get somewhere else. Is there any incentive for early liquidity providers? So like, you know, for let's say there's an illiquid market and, you know, I can be the first one to, or earlier to find liquidity and that can help the market grow. The only, there's only an incentive in that if there's a, already a high demand and there's no liquidity, then while you're the earlier provider, you're getting a higher percentage of the fees until more people join the market. But the way Uniswap works is your fees are directly proportional to the, the, to the uh, liquidity that you put up. And... You know, so you can put in a million dollars and you're the first person and you do it for a month and you're getting 100% of the fees. Someone else comes in, puts in another million dollars, you know, they're getting 50%, you're getting 50%. And maybe, you know, they're, they're, more, they're willing to take less profit and, than you. And so maybe you have to exit a little bit of your liquidity. It's really just proportional to what you put in. There's no um, early, there's no benefits just because you were there earlier. And so is there any quote unquote unbonding period from a liquidity pool? No, it's all instant. So as a provider, I could like, you know, you know, given that ETH is like the common trading volume, I, I, you know, it's in my incentive to be running some sort of node that is automatically like rebalancing my ETH from like different liquidity pools. Yeah. So, I mean, I talked earlier about how like market makers could get the uh, almost the Robin Hood level experience if, you know, with a little bit of work on our end. Um, but for people who are more sophisticated, who want to make higher profits, they can essentially uh, adjust their rates by making a... Tr so in Uniswap, you know, people say, you know, you can't, it always lags the market, you can't ad adjust your spot price. Um, but you really can by making a trade and add a liquid adding liquidity or making a trade and removing liquidity and then... Or, or removing liquidity, making a trade and then adding it back in synchronously. You can just like line up a series of transactions that sort of adjust the rate and your liquidity contributions. So there are definitely, there's definitely room for a lot more sophisticated market makers. And that's something that we're sort of very into and we're experimenting with as, as well. And also sort of uh, optimizing, you know, 
ideally you can uh, you can model the optimal amount of liquidity for an asset based off certain properties such as volatility of the asset um, and yeah and demand for it. So, so one of the things that seems like a challenging aspect here, let's say you have a market where you know there's not that much liquidity or kind of like liquidity goes down, then okay, but maybe I can go and I can lend my ETH on Dharma or like BlockFi somewhere else and I make whatever, 6% there, but now the trading volume is very low and you know I'm only making 2% on Uniswap. So I want to like take my ETH out and put it somewhere else. But of course, that means that now the liquidity has decreased and the slippage is higher. So it becomes like even more unattractive to trade. So like this is kind of like a death spiral seems to be like pretty likely to happen often. No? Um, so that's what I was worried about when I released Uniswap. It seems to have been the other side of the death spiral. It seems to be a life spiral of like um, trading drives liquidity, drives more trading, drives more liquidity, drives more trading, drives more liquidity. That seems to, I was worried about that early on. Um, and, you know, it's, it still is possible, especially in certain, you know, if, if some assets change a huge amount in, in value. Uh, one thing I've noticed is that, um, well, but I, I, one thing I've noticed is that, you know, when a, when a asset does go down a lot in value, um, there is also a lot more trading in that moment. Before we get too far into this, maybe I should explain a little bit of how the losses in Uniswap work. I, I don't. I, I think that you know that makes so. So profits are just are there just based off the fee volume, right? And every trade that happens affects the uh, the fee profits, and every trade is profitable uh, for liquidity providers um, in 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 one way. Um, but the other the uh, so it's um, it's you know, and we call it like path independent, right? It, or it's, it's or path dependent, sorry. Every, everything that happens on Uniswap affects your profits, um, your, your fees. Yeah, so basically, if a, if a asset goes up in Uniswap very high relative to the other, so you have ETH and MKR. Let's say MKR triples and ETH stays the same. As MKR goes up in value, the, uh, the contract automatically rebalances all the liquidity providers more heavily towards ETH, right? So it sells on the... Uh, it sells on the way up and it buys on the way down. Um, and so you don't get all of the uh, benefits of that MKR tripling. Um, and so that basically loses you money relative to holding those assets. And so what you need is you need the uh, profits from fees to outweigh losses from this, uh, from this auto rebalancing. And, and those numbers are really kind of deterministic. So you know if you put an ETH in DAI and then the price of ETH rel uh, doubles relative to DAI, then relative, to, uh, so you, when you put in ETH and DAI, you put in 50% uh, value of ETH and 50% value of DAI. So maybe it's, you know, $100,000 of each. And then if ETH were to double in value, you know, if you were holding your assets outside of Uniswap, right, you would have, um, you would now have $100,000 of DAI still, because the DAI is the same, but you would now have $200,000 of ETH, right? So your total value at the end would be $300,000. But in Uniswap, it would auto rebalance some of your ETH towards DAI as ETH was increasing in price. So if ETH were to double, you'd actually have 5% less in, uh, in value um, than you would if you, were, if you held your initial position. And so in order for that to be profitable, you need to have made at least 5% in fees during that period of time. And on the way down is the same way, right? So basically yeah. you're always worse off I mean, again, ignoring the fees, if you have your, you're holding kind of li your liquidity pair, then if you're just holding like ETH and DAI in this example. Uh, correct. Although the numbers at which you're worse off is not insanely high, and it always performs in between the two assets. Um, so it, one, one interesting way of, uh, it's actually the, uh, the geometric, you basically get the geometric mean of the returns instead of the arithmetic mean. So if... Normally, if one asset goes up 200% and the other asset goes up 50%, uh, 100%, then you get between the two, you get 150% returns on the, on the initial value. Uh, versus in Uniswap, you, you'd basically get the, uh, the, the, geome the geometric mean, which is always a little bit less than the arithmetic mean. Um, so off a 2x, that's 5% uh, less. Off a uh, 3x, it's 13% less. Off a 50% change, it's 2% um, less. Off a twenty-five percent change, it's like 0.5 percent less. Um, but these these numbers are really, um, you know, they're, they're, they can all be predetermined. You know, if I put them in my assets and they start at this price and I take them out and they end at this price, like you'll know exactly what that loss is. 
And so if you know what the daily vo volume will be in that time period, you can sort of adjust your risk and you can sort of see whether or not it will be profitable for you. Let's talk about security. You know, dApps are pretty unique because unlike other types of software, they can hold astronomical amounts of value. That's why getting systems audited, creating robust security processes, and fostering a culture of security in your organization is so important. And to do this, you should only trust experts with real security expertise. There are a lot of security firms in the blockchain space, but few have the experience and track record of Trail of Bits. And they've been in business since 2012, long before things like the DAO hack were even imaginable. Trail of Bits works with your team to audit every aspect of your project. And smart contract code is just the beginning. They'll help you implement best practices around things like DevOps, key storage, and user-facing applications. And once your software has been rigorously tested and reviewed by Trail of Bits, they'll provide the tools you need to make sure that your code remains safe over every new commit. They can even put a software security expert at your team's disposal who'll give you advice and answer your questions when you need them. It's like having your own security engineer on staff, but don't take my word for it. Go to their publications repo on GitHub to read their papers, presentations, and security reviews. It's no wonder teams like Parity, Status, New Cipher, and organizations like Facebook and DARPA trust Trail of Bits for their security audits. To learn more, go to trailofbits.com, and if you decide to reach out, make sure you let them know you heard about them on Epicenter. We'd like to thank Trail of Bits for their support. So, I mean, given that we can, you know, it's pretty easy to mathematically model what the expected loss would be, is, it, is there no way we could design a fee mechanism to the market makers that ensures that it uh, overcomes that loss, essentially, where like, you know, to make sure that like, you know, it not 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 having it be so constant, because that's, that's another thing I see is that like, you know, the fact that it's like fixed at 0.3%. And, you know, right now, there's no sort of way for anyone to change that. Like, we, we you know, we had the DX DAO project on uh, it, the, the show uh, a couple months ago. And so they actually have like, this DAO that controls the governance of this Dutch X exchange. And the, the reason that they're able to do this is that so, so that the DAO can modify parameters of the Dutch X in order to make it, you know, be competitive with like market forces. And so, you know, they could change the liquidity uh, shares that the, like the, the fee and whatnot. But if there's no DAO here in Uniswap to like do this kind of stuff, how do we make sure that, you know, Uniswap is able to remain competitive? Yeah, yeah, there's a few options. And definitely dynamic fees is a open research topic that we're, we're heavily looking into. Um, there are all sorts of proposals such as, you know, automating the uh, fee based, you know, proportional to the slippage of the tra transaction. You know, that's one example. Um, or, you know, so we're, we're looking into it. And the other option is basically, you know, you could have a different contract for different fee levels and liquidity providers could just kind of deposit their liquidity and the one that they think is, you know, most likely to be profitable. And, you know, you would assume that liquidity kind of accumulates in the one that has the highest fees. Um, part of the issue there is that you can sort of, um, you know, then you might split up your liquidity, which gives you worse rates for users. If, you know, some, if half the liquidity pr providers on a pair put them in one fee level and half put them in another. So it, it is, um, but it is something we're, we're heavily looking into. And ideally, you know, Governance DAOs are fun and all. Um, we would love to have it fully automated in a way that can still be profitable. Um, and, you know, that's something we're heavily looking into. And, and one option is also to have it proportional to volatility, um, because that is one of the sort of most important metrics for losses and for fees. Right. So it seems that there's essentially three main things, like three, or from what I can tell, three main uh, factors that we should be taking into account. One is volume, which is what it currently is doing. Uh, the other is spread, which is kind of what most market makers on order book basic changes. That's where their primary profit comes from is off of spread. And then the third is the volatility. And that's important to take into account because like, like we said, based off of how the losses in Uniswap work, that is what mostly that that's what we need to offset. So, so kind of dealing with those three aspects is kind of the, uh, yeah. main, I trend. mean, I mean, funny enough, it's, it's been like, it's been working like, you know, the 0.3% the basically was a, was a YOLO um, from a conversation with me and Vitalik about like, what might be the most optimal fee? And it was kind of um, the, way, the way we chose it was basically to be competitive with other DEXs um, and sort of not having it too low, not having it too high. 
Um, and it's actually working for a lot of markets, which is kind of which is pretty cool. Um, so the MKR pair, for example, has been fairly profitable. Uh, the 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 Dai pair has been fairly profitable for liquidity providers, and it is working pretty well have, with the with the YOLO fee amount. And so now we're but we're now we're putting a lot more time. You know, we have a lot more data to work with because these these uh, this exchange has been running for a while. It's done you know close to two hundred million dollars in trading since November. It's uh, there's twenty million dollars locked up, and so we're we're able to look a little bit closer and maybe see how different fee levels would have performed, see how different types of uh, dynamic fees might have performed, and kind of model it a little bit better. And I, I am, it is very likely we're going to propose a version two of the protocol that adds in some new features. Version one of Uniswap is very good, but I, I don't think it's like the best it can be. And then one more like thing that might you know I, I'd be personally interested in. In a in a version two would be, you know, more complex uh, bonding uh, curves, right? Because like currently, I think you know x times y equals k seems to be highly simplistic, and it you know it, it, it's asymptotical on both ends. And you know, is there any reason why it couldn't be you know some closer to flat or like you know even have constants in uh like so it skews it somewhat? And so is that something that uh well. One, what is the benefit of that x times y equals k? Is there something, some special properties about this equation that makes it useful? Yeah, yeah. So the, the special property about the equation is that it always keeps a 50-50 value of both assets. And it also, and there are other, there are other equations that might work. Um, but it also uh, minimizes slippage, or at least that's what the sort of current uh, belief is, is that um, you know, we haven't found any other curves that would allow you to have, like, if, if, the, if your curve moves, like, kind of steeper in some places and more shallow in other places, then you're going to have more slippage on, that pl- on those places. Um, and so in Uniswap, because it's kind of an even curve, you, you know, no matter where you are in the, in the, uh, in the market, you're going to have kind of the least slippage possible while maintaining a 50-50 value of each. Now, one, one topic that we should bring up here briefly, which is, of course, always a topic for decentralized exchanges, is the topic of front-running for example, like a miner can see, okay, you're putting in a big order, there's going to be some sort of slippage, and then they can try to exploit that in some way. Maybe they can like reorder the transactions and put one of theirs in first, or you know, maybe do some other things. So is this front-running a concern? Have you seen any evidence of people actually doing front-running? And you know, what's kind of your thoughts in general? There, there's definitely front-running. Um, if you go to, I believe it's frontrun.me, and I believe frontrun.me slash revenue or profit, I forget which one it is, uh, there, you basically can see a list of all front-running transactions on Ethereum. This is from uh, Phil Dye, and it's some really interesting research. Um, but yeah, so there's definitely front-running v- very active on all Ethereum DEXs, and, and any Ethereum DEX that says there's no front-running, unlikely, except for maybe, unless it has some sort of centralized component to it, which is preventing it. Um, I guess AirSwap is, is fairly pr- uh, front-running resistant, and I guess uh, DutchX is fairly front-running resistant. Um, but so on, on Uniswap, the current parameters that are sort of prevent, uh, preventing some level of front running is the, uh, there's a minimum slippage uh, parameter that you can set when you make a trade. So you can basically say, I'm making my trade. So the, the, the type of front running, uh, front running that's really scary for users is, you know, I'm selling one ETH, then the front runner sees this transaction coming in. They put in a transaction ahead of it that pushes the price, gives me a worse rate. And so I make a trade at a worse rate, and then they trade back against my trade, um, and they take some profits. And the, uh, the, the most baked in mechanism for, there's a few ba- uh, mechanisms. One is just the fees on the transactions. So, the mi- uh, so if, you, if you do a large trade in both directions on Uniswap, that really pushes the rate a significant amount in a large liquidity pool, you might actually have to pay a pretty large fee to liquidity providers for that. Uh, but that's, you know, still, you can still find trades where it's guaranteed profit for the, for the uh, front runner. Uh, so that's not really that big a mit- uh, mitigation. Um, there's also, the, but the min slippage value is basically, you know, I'm selling one ETH and the current price is uh, 200 DAI. And if I get any less than 199.7 DAI, I want the transaction to fail. And so, you know, you don't know, someone can push the price ahead of you, but only up to the amount that you've allowed in your transaction. Um, and so that's, that's the main mitigation in Uniswap. The, uh, the balance that you're trying to find is essentially... You know, if, if you make it too tight, you know, if you say even a 0.0001% slippage will make my transaction fail, then tr- uh, transactions could fail from normal trading vo- uh, volume. 
which you don't really want to happen. You don't. You, it's kind of bad UX to have all your transactions failing. So you want to make a, you want to make some allowance, but not so much that it's extremely profitable for um, for uh, front runners. Another sort of mitigation is these uh, deadline parameters, which is basically you know this transaction can only execute within this time frame, and so it prevents miners from holding transactions and executing them at a time where it's more profitable for the miner. Uh, it, well, it, it prevents it from them from doing holding them for too long. You know, if you set it to five minutes, then the miner only has f- a five minute window where they can execute your trade at a better time for them and worth for you. Um, now we're looking into some very cool stuff, uh, which can help reduce front running or, to some extent, socialize it. It's um, it's kind of an interesting mechanism. We we call it Trader DAO, but it doesn't need to be a DAO. Um, essentially, what it is is a pool of liquidity that grants a specific party first arbitrage rights on Uniswap in exchange for rebating some of their arbitrage profits to the uh, trader. Um, it's kind of an interesting mechanism, but basically the way it works is I, you know, I, I, I want to make a sell on Uniswap. Um, so you know how like Kyber works, for example? Um, Kyber basically, it's, it's uh, unlike Uniswap, which automates the spread, they have you know, uh, market makers that are posting prices. Um, and and then they have a spread, so they have a they have their own like price oracle stuff, um, each each uh, reserve on chain reserve for a token, and then it creates a spread around that price, um, and so they'll always buy at one price, they'll always sell at one price, and so you could have a you could have a similar contract that that sits in in between uh, traders and Uniswap contracts, and if I want to sell, let's say I want to sell a million dollars on Uniswap, I if I'm selling it into a pool with that which only has two million dollars in it. I'm going to get 50% slippage on my transaction. That's pretty awful. Um, and the person who profits off that 50% slippage is not the uh, liquidity provider, as you might expect. The person who profits off that slippage is the uh, arbitrage, the first arbitrager to shift that rate, from, to make the trade in the reverse direction, to shift that rate back to the, to the real rate. Um, they, they make all the profits from that, except for the 0.3% fee profit. And so instead, you could have a, a liquidity pool that maintains it, a, a, a sort of privately managed liquidity pool that's maintaining its own, its own uh, sort of price feed that has a l- large liquidity reserve in it. And then I want to make my trade on Uniswap. I say, I want to sell this million dollars on Uniswap. You can either do one of two things. You can forward this trade onto Uniswap, and it will execute like normal. You, know, you can't make the transaction fail. You can forward it to Uniswap, or you can execute this trade on Uniswap, and then synchronously execute the arbitrage back. Uh, and then, you know, if it, this shifts the rate 50%, you can shift the rate back from 50 to, to 45. And then, um, and then I will get, you know, I'll only have 5% slippage. And then the, uh, the person who, who, who pushes the price back, the, 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 uh, what is, what, the trader DAO, basically could take profits on shifting it the, the rest of the way. So the 5% to the 0%. And so that basically is uh, an interesting way of, of giving better execution to users um, and reducing slippage for, for large trades. Does that kind of make sense? I, don't know. I think that does make sense in a high level. Now, I would love to speak a little bit about decentralized exchanges in general. So, you know, we've, we've kind of talked about how Uniswap works, but what do you think are some of the unique things and like use cases where you think that, you know, maybe decentralized exchanges or Uniswap in particular you know, they really have a, like an advantage versus centralized exchanges. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are all sorts of problems with these with centralized exchanges. Um, you know, Mt. Gox, sure, but that, that's the one people point to. But like, you can look two weeks ago to Binance losing $50 million of Bitcoin. Or, um, right, uh, so the biggest, the biggest vulnerability, the biggest problem with centralized exchanges is, is probably security. Uh, but then they also, you know, they can shut down your account I, I used to have a Bitrix account, and you know they they removed all trading in New York. They they deactivated my account this week, um, so I can no longer use Bitrix. And I had to, if I if I don't, didn't withdraw funds in time, then I would have lost them all. Uh, never been able to withdraw. Uh, another example is someone once sent me uh, some ZRX tokens to my. They asked me for my Coinbase address to to give me some ETH. They sent, and I didn't realize that they sent were sending me ZRX tokens, um, which you can send to an Ethereum address on Coinbase. Uh, but because I was in New York, you know, I was actually not allowed to withdraw them. And so they're just permanently locked in Coinbase, um, the ZRX tokens, because I thought I was getting paid in ETH. Anyway, so that's like another example um, of centralized exchanges not being so great. Um, so there's all sorts of security issues. There's all sorts of uh, 
issues with uh, censorship and uh, things getting shut down. Um, you know, they're also they're also charging really high fees, right? Uh, Coinbase, if if I want to buy some ETH, it's like a one percent fee or something crazy. Uh, which you know, I guess even which Uniswap you know tries to lower to 0.3%. percent. Um, yeah, Wait, were you, were you mostly offer, uh, asking about decentralized versus centralized or decentralized versus other decentralized? Yeah, no, I think that that was that was good. I mean, one of the so one of the things that I, I would encourage our listeners to to watch. So this is great talk by Arthur Hayes, and he's the you know the I think CEO or one of the founders of uh, this exchange called Bitmex. And BitMEX is, you know, I think the largest volume kind of trading platform. Uh, it's also sort of a thing quite different from Binance, but gigantic volumes. And it's interesting because it's to talk about decentralized exchanges. And of course, he runs a centralized exchange. But then, you know, he basically says, okay, what are the people kind of proposing that are building decentralized exchanges? And, you know, do people actually care about it? And, you know, he makes this argument that, okay, well, people care about, you know, number one is liquidity, you know, number two is leverage. Uh, and those are the two most important things. And then he says, like, okay, three, ease of use. And then, you know, security is sort of a, like, it's nice to have, but people don't care about it that much. And uh, it was pretty interesting, you know, because it kind of brings up the question, you know, to what extent, you know, are these things that, we're kind of building out of this, you know, idealism and maybe coming to crypto with this idea, okay, people should own their own assets and control their keys and stuff like that versus pe things that people actually truly, you know, demand and want and value. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think that's kind of BS, um, not, not to insult Arthur Hayes, but um, like, I think that it's true to some extent. I think that, you know, there are things people care about and there are things people don't really care about. But like, if we don't care about decentralization and we don't care about censorship resistance and we don't care about like being non-custodial, then like, why have blockchains? Like, what are what are any of us doing here? Right? None of it matters if we don't care about these things. <laughs> like, um, I also think that like, you know, hand waving security is a little bit weird, and I think that security is one of the biggest properties of decentralized exchanges that matter. Right? Reducing um, you know single points of failure. Um, I agree that you can get a lot of volume in a centralized exchange. Um, I think a lot of people who are speculating don't care, but I think that a lot of people who are like building decentralized projects on Ethereum do care about decentralization. And I think that like Uniswap's kind of success so far has been evidence of that. Um, you can see sort of some examples uh, to kind of continue some of the kind of benefits of. A, of, I, I didn't really even get through my complaints on centralized exchanges. I just forgot some of them uh, in the moment, um, which is that, like, for example, token listing. Like, if I want to list my token on an exchange, like, what do, you, what do I have to do? I have to, like, you know, sometimes I have to pay $20,000. Sometimes I have to pay $50,000. Um, I can't do it. And, like, if, you know, if you want to, if you sort of envision a world with a lot of tokens that, like, sort of are each filling filling different use cases, you know, maybe you have per personal tokens, maybe you have communal, communal tokens, um, not everyone wants to like sort of pay the entry fee. Um, and uh, one thing you could do with Uniswap is basically anyone can create the exchange for their own token and anyone can trade it, anyone can pool liquidity. And there have been some like really cool examples of this in Uniswap so far. Um, so the uh, one cool one was, for example, uh, was uh, the uh, Reddit Karma uh, Donuts, um, where basically someone... Uh, Someone created a, a on ramp for Reddit Karma. Red, basically, Reddit introduced a feature that allowed you to um, track Karma on a per subreddit basis and actually transfer it around and use it in uh, in polls. And so they created a, a governance system on on the ETH Trader subreddit, and they allowed people to sort of mi uh, use their Reddit Karma. And then someone created a bridge that allowed you to turn that into an ERC twenty token on Ethereum. And um, someone pinged me one day and was like, by the way, people are trading Reddit Karma on Uniswap. I was like, wait, what? Um, I, I created Uniswap. I, I, I made the smart contract. I made the front end. But like, I didn't know about this. And then um, <laughs> you know, I, I looked through the sort of the contracts. And within you know, three days of this, of this sort of someone creating this Reddit ERC-20 bridge, um, people traded $30,000 worth of Reddit Karma on Uniswap, um, which you know, allowed them to vote in governance polls on on. And then, you know, the guy operating the bridge kind of freaked out and shut it down. Um, but, you know, ideally, 
the uh, the social media platform would would have a more de- decentralized uh, component that wouldn't allow anyone to shut it down. Um, yeah. So, and another example would be like, you know, for real tokens like you know Spank or MKR um, that have not traditionally the teams behind them have really been adamant on like not paying listing fees and not like, you know, um, and and they've it's been really hard to buy MKR and it's been pretty high. Uh, for most exchanges, but because of the permissionless nature of Uniswap, you know, Uniswap now has $6 million in the, in the uh, ETH to MKR pool, and it's basically become the largest exchange for MKR. Um, and, and similarly, it's, it's the largest exchange for Spank tokens, which, you know, also they don't want to pay, uh, pay any exchanges to, to list their token. And it's also the largest exchange for, or so it's one of the larger exchanges for Foam, which is another project that sort of follows these values. Um, so I think that the uh, permissionless listing uh, allowing anyone to deploy their own exchange, stuff like this is is a big deal. I mean, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, I think like one of the places where decentralized exchanges really shine over decentralized ones is in this listing of exotic assets, like you mentioned. And for example, let's say someone had like created a staking derivative of like bonded atoms to the course one validator, right? Like, which exchange is going to go list that on, like, you know, you're not going to get BitMEX to go list that and like, you know, provide all these features, but like, you know, anyone can then go ahead and take that staking derivative and like, you know, create a Uniswap uh, contract on it. And I think, and so, I, and so, you know, I think given that that's where, you know, I think out of where Uniswap really shines is that it provides some level of usability to even very low uh, liquidity assets. And Correct. because of this, I think it works well where like you can have this uh, like, you know, it, 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 I think Uniswap really kind of probably why we've seen Uniswap grow to be the largest uh, decentralized exchange so far is because it really hit that product market fit where like, okay, it is the one that's best for dealing with exotic assets, which is what people are actually using decentralized exchanges for. Yeah, yeah, no, I I agree with that. Um, it's also there's also a, a UX component to it uh, and a, a kind of uh, integrations component to it. Where so Uniswap is incredibly simple. Um, it's 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 accessible fully on chain. You can integrate it into your project very easily. You can you can bootstrap your own liquidity really easily. Um, it's you know it's highly programmable. Um, I guess one thing that we kind of didn't talk about, which I sort of I think I saw in some of the notes, but I be, uh, was the uh, sort of like the aspect of liquidity tokens. And this actually plays into the leverage that Arthur Hayes was talking about, which is basically if you're a liquidity provider on Uniswap, you can, you know, you could lock up some ETH and some DAI. And actually, while your, your, your tokens are locked up, so if you're, it, you, know, you have the ability to withdraw your proportional share at any moment, but you also get an ERC-20 token that represents your right to withdraw that share. And so you could, um, you basically, you burn this token to withdraw your liquidity, but you can also transfer it around and it can also be used in other contracts. So an example usage could be that you you know you lock up your 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 liquidity in Uniswap, you get some uh, you get your liquidity shares, uh, you collateralize, and so you now you you now have a position on both assets in Uniswap, you know maybe ETH and MKR, and you're also generating fees on Uniswap, and then you could lock up these liquidity tokens. You could actually take out a loan against these liquidity tokens. You could open up a CDP in multi-collateral die, or on or you could take a loan on Dharma. You could you could like you know take a loan get out against these assets um, trustlessly. And then you could, um, you know, increase your leverage. You could maybe you could uh, collateralize your liquidity shares and become and take out enough ETH to become a uh, a uh, validator, or maybe you uh, in proof of stake when when that exists. And maybe you can, um, or or maybe you could, you know, swap. You could take out some, you could take out some ETH and you could swap half of it for a die and you put that back into the liquidity pool. And now you've leveraged up on Uniswap fees. Has anyone you created a Uniswap market against liquidity pool? Liquidity tokens? Yeah, yeah. You actually, someone did create a Uniswap uh, liquidity pool for ETH to die shares on Uniswap, um, which is <laughs> kind of funny. Um, it's, you know, it, it kind of works. It kind of makes sense. There's not much liquidity in it right now, but it, it could be kind of a cool way to like on ramp onto Uniswap really easily. If you want to become a liquidity provider and you don't want to go, you could just send some ETH to this contract and you'll immediately get, you'll ma- immediately be a liquidity provider. Another kind of interesting thing that happened. As I think Compound sort of saw this uh, this model that we were using that I that we kind of created for Uniswap, where you have shares that represent your portion of the pool, and they kind of added this thing they call uh, C tokens or Compound tokens, which are basically 
if you lend your die on compound, you get something called C die, which represents your ability to withdraw the die that you lent on compound, plus any interest uh, generated. And so it kind of does, you can do the same thing in reverse. You can lend your die on compound and then take out the C die, and then you can lock those in a Uniswap pool against ETH. And actually now you can um, you know, immediately go from ETH to, to you could go from uh, owning an ETH uh, uh, position to um, owning a, 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 a interest generating DAI position and a single swap on Uniswap. And this is actually happened, and it kind of allows you to increase your leverage once again. Um, and this actually already happened. Uh, you know, once again, without me doing anything, without me saying anything, because it's decentralized, um, Compound or some people affiliated or just some random person uh, took you know, $150,000 worth of Compound DAI uh, and put it in a, in a Uniswap pool. So now you can you know, swap between Ether and Compound DAI or Compound DAI and any other ERC-20 token through Uniswap in a, in a single transaction. But yeah, no, I totally agree. I think that's probably the most powerful thing about decentralized exchanges is just this aspect of like, okay, you can like easily integrate it and innovate on top. So let's speak about the business model, right? Because Uniswap doesn't, you know, m many tokens, like you mentioned, or you ma many projects, you mentioned, for example, Bancor is a, is an example, which is similar, but then they put in the Bancor token. And of course the Bancor token, they did uh, an ICO and they own part of it. And if it succeeds, it will be worth a lot of money. And, you know, kind of the, the sort of, you know, traditional way of monetizing crypto project. And now you haven't gone down that way, right? There's no direct way that Uniswap is monetizing you did raise a, a seed round recently. Congratulations on that. And so you have a company now. Uh, what's what's the what's the business model of that company? To to jump back, like I think that like ultimately, like there was this traditional, there was this ICO boom, and everyone was selling a token. Um, but I think it became clear to a lot of people that it didn't make sense. Most a lot of these tokens didn't make sense, and I'm not going to point fingers, but like. I think that the projects that are going to be successful in crypto are projects that build the best version of that they can, not a version that's easiest to monetize. Um, and that was sort of the idea going into Uniswap. Um, that said, you know, it's a very legitimate question. You know, how how do how do you make money on a public good? Because right now Uniswap is essentially a public good. And I, I will say that I raised money on the idea that the value that there's value to the brand and the reputation that I'm creating and there's value to being at the center of DeFi and to being at the center of this like decentralized exchange thing and this decentralized yeah, financial system. Um, we are still deciding, you know, we're, we have a lot of cool things we want to build, or like a lot, a lot, a lot of cool things we want to build on top of Uniswap. Um, and we think some of them can have cool business models to them. I'm not ready to kind of like immediately just start listing things off. Um, but I will say that, you know, it's more about, you know, like uh, it's not that crazy to have companies that aren't immediately generating revenue that are valuable, right? You know, a lot of projects in, in this current, in Silicon Valley right now are still not profitable and worth, you know, $50 billion or something, right? I don't even know if Uber makes money yet. Long story short, uh, you know, we'll see. We, we have some really cool things we want to build, but, you know, still, I, I, I don't want to go too far down the uh, path of exactly what it is until we've more clearly decided on the exact route we're pursuing. Did you ever consider, you know, integrating a token in there or like, was it clear to you kind of from the start that it didn't really make sense? I'm not against tokens. I'm not even against integrating tokens into Uniswap. Uh, breaking news. I, um, I'm against doing things for no reason. If it becomes clear that for Uniswap to make sense, we need, we need um, a actual group of people modifying parameters, then maybe we need a token to, to, to control that. But I'm not kind of letting the cart lead the horse on, on introducing unnecessary features, or like introducing a token before, we, before it's very clear that it's necessary. Um, so yes, there, there are potential, you know, DAO mechanisms that could make sense. Or you could just, you know, generate, you know, maybe you, you, maybe you build a contract that adds some service or builds some cool thing on top of Uniswap that, that takes out a little fee and it's not built into the core protocol. I, I don't think that everything needs to be built into the core protocol. Um, I also, something that's been kind of, I'm still sort of thinking through, um, 
but something that I've been thinking about a lot recently is that in the sort of Silicon Valley model for companies has been like someone creates something, they own a percentage of it forever, for all eternity. And I don't know how much that makes sense. I think that like, what if, what if Mark Zuckerberg created Facebook and Facebook owed him $10 billion? And then after, after he got paid $10 billion, like, screw Mark Zuckerberg, he doesn't need any more money uh, for what he did building Facebook initially. Um, so I'm, I've sort of been thinking about this idea of like um, uh, protocols owe, owing their, their creators something, but not something forever. Anyway, it's, it's I, I, I then he, still he would have be, to be very poor. More Mark Zuckerberg with only like, ten he, billion dollars, incredibly I mean, poor, right? Like, <laughs> how how awful would it be if he only had ten billion dollars and not, you know, fifty percent of Facebook for all eternity? Yeah, so I, I, I just it's something I've been thinking about. Like, yeah, I, I think that you know, public uh, there is a really interesting trade off between like profitable projects and like pro- and like optimal projects in the crypto space. And it's kind of interesting. Um, But ideally, you know, you can strike a balance. And I'm I'm not like, personally too worried. We we have a pretty decent runway to work with from our seed round. um, And and we have a lot of cool ideas. Yeah, I mean, that's where I think like things like the uh, Zcash founding founders reward and stuff are also like interesting ideas as well. Definitely. And so really quickly, you know, kind of going back to like exotic assets, and you know, your, your revenue model, you know, I think one of the most exotic assets I've heard about being traded on uh, Uniswap is these tokenized socks. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about these? Yeah, um, this is a project I really just wanted to do for an incredibly long time. Uh, it kind of came out, out of these, so I'm wearing one of these Uniswap shirts, which were sort of cool. Um, and so we kind of, you know, people kept telling me, oh, you should create a liquidity pool for your Uniswap shirts. And you know, people, I've, I've been sort of thinking about what it means to kind of combine these digital assets with these physical assets. Um, and so sort of a higher overview of what Unisox is, uh, is we created a, a token, um, Socks, it's called, that's the ticker. And uh, the name is Unisox version one or edition one. Um, and each, and the idea is simple. You, you, you create these Socks, uh, a limited scarce supply. So we created 500 Socks tokens, and then we locked them in a liquidity pool with some ETH. And so that sets this initial bonding curve where, where you can send ETH to the contract and you get SOX out. Or you could send SOX to the contract and you get ETH out. Um, but we put the, because we put the total supply of all SOX in the, from the very beginning and no more can be created directly into the liquidity pool with ETH, that kind of starts you all the way at the bottom of the curve. And so every pair of SOX you buy kind of increases the cost of the next one. Uh, but at any point in time, you can sell back into the market. Uh, so if you buy 10 SOX and someone else buys 10 SOX, then the first person can sell them back and actually make some profit, uh, and so it's kind of a it's a kind of a funny thing. Um, but the what will happen is that you know every sock token uh, will be redeemable. You know you can so there's 500 sock tokens and you can burn a sock token and it will be redeemable uh, and basically pa- uh, give a you know send your address and we'll mail you a pair of socks, uh, limited edition, uh, high quality socks with you know with the name with with some with a cool design on it. Um, Anywhere in the world, basically. Um, uh, well, almost anywhere in the world. Uh, Phil Dyan was uh, creating a tax on Uniswap, the, or on Unisox the other day, and he pointed out that two ways, that two two things you could we couldn't send it to is you know sanctioned countries, and you can't send either, so that would be an attack if you if you're like burned a stock token and say send it to this address in a sanctioned country. Obviously, we're not going to do that. Um, the other attack would be. <laughs> Um, getting a uh, sending, have, uh, ordering a few pairs of socks to an address, getting out a restraining order for some, for some weird person sending you socks, and then ordering more socks. But anyway, that's kind of going way down a rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the point is that obviously you we will only send it to a reasonable location. But um, yeah, so every pair of socks, every socks token can be burned, and will will be redeemable for a real pair of socks mailed directly to your address. And it's an experiment with UX in uh, in uh, buying stuff on on uh, through crypto. It's an experiment in price discovery for rare merchandise. So an interesting thing is that like if you if if uh, Nike's re- uh, releases like a rare pair of sneakers, a rare edition Yeezys or something, um, you know there's a limited supply, 
and they sell them at a flat rate, right? They'll, they'll, or probably usually, you know, maybe it's $200 per, or $300 each. But then there's this whole secondary market that's created around it where people buy them for $300 and they resell them for $2,000 or, you know, the first people to buy them can sell them a lot more. And strangely, uh, you know, Nike's only indirect, doesn't really directly benefit from the fact that they're, they're t- and the creators of the, and the designers of the, of, the, uh, of the shoes also, they don't directly benefit from the socks going to $3,000 versus $300, unless they maybe keep a few pairs for themselves or something like that. So the idea with this is that, you know, you, you put it on this bonding curve and then the, the price of the, of the asset will just automatically go to, you know, whatever the value is, whatever people are willing to buy for it. And the, uh, the company who created it, the designers behind it, they can kind of directly profit from the secondary market, which is kind of built in. There's only a, it's like there is only one. There, there's no need for a secondary market because it's built into the, the primary market. Right. So that, that is your business model. It's not our business model directly, but like it's an, it's a, it's an experiment. It's, um, I mean, we didn't do it for no reason. Um, it's, uh, we technically sold $10,000 worth of socks in, in like two days. Exactly. <laughs> um, and there's right. been about, and funny enough, you know, we sold $10,000 of socks, but people are trading them back and forth now. Uh, and there's been probably like $50,000 worth of socks trading, uh, not stocks trading, socks trading, um, in, in, in the past few weeks, uh, which is, which is pretty funny. Cool. Thanks so much uh, for coming on. And it was really uh, interesting to hear about Uniswap and your plans. I think lots of lots of exciting things here. And uh, we're really excited to see kind of like what what's going to come out of it with all these improvements and different plans and iterations on it. So yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. Click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto. You can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcast apps. Click here for a full list of places where you can listen. Thanks for watching Epicenter, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.